If you watched the last video I did on the three different methods you can use to solve trigonometric equations, you may have been left thinking, okay, great, but how do I solve equations like these? In this video, I'm going to show you how to solve more complex trigonometric equations by applying the same methods that I showed you in the previous video. I've mentioned that trigonometric equations have at least two solutions. Well, at least means two or more. So I want to walk you through an example of a trigonometric equation that has more than two solutions. We're being asked to determine the angles that satisfy this equation on the interval 0 to 2 pi. Now you may remember one of the methods I showed you involved the use of special triangles. However, because the ratio I'm given does not involve special side lengths, we aren't able to use that method. So the best approach here would be to take the sine inverse in order to determine at least one of the angles that satisfies this equation. So when I take the sine inverse of both sides, I effectively undo the sine operation on the left side, which results in this expression. The sine inverse of 0.76 gives me approximately 0 0.8633. So if I consider this angle right here to be 2x, and I use my understanding of the cast rule, remember my sine ratio is positive, so I can say this angle lies in the first quadrant. I'm also interested in the second angle, which you'll recall I can find by subtracting 0 0.8633 from pi. When I do that, I get a second angle, 2.2783. So that's two solutions. Now at this point, I haven't actually determined the angle x that I'm looking for. I've determined 2x. In order to determine the angles that I'm interested in, I'm going to divide these two by 2. And you should see that both of these angles will satisfy this equation. And a quick check on a graphing calculator will confirm this. However, remember, we're looking on the interval 2 pi. And you can see here, I actually have two more solutions. Now this should make sense. Remember, the function sine of x has a period of 2 pi. What we've done is compress one full cycle of the sine graph into pi, which means two full cycles will fit into 2 pi. So it makes sense that if I go through one more cycle, I should have two more angles that satisfy my equation and result in 0 0.76. So if sine of 2x has a period of pi, I should be able to add pi to each of these angles to produce two more solutions to this equation. Picture that I start at 0 0.432 and I go through one full cycle in pi. That will take me to my second solution of 3.573. Likewise, if I start at 1.139 and I go through one full cycle of pi, that should take me to 4.281. And from there, I produce four solutions that will satisfy this equation. Now you can see that the solution to this problem involved knowledge of all three methods that I showed you in the previous video lesson. I leaned a little bit on my understanding of the graph of sine of x and sine of 2x. I used my understanding of the cast rule, and I also used my understanding of the sine inverse operation. So you can see why it's a good thing to know a little bit about each method for solving a trig equation. This next example is one of my favorites, mostly because it's just so complex and terrible looking. But we can make this much, much simpler if we use what's called the substitution. Now I'm asking you to be a little bit patient with me in this one because I'm going to show you a strategy that is not immediately intuitive and you would probably never really think of doing unless you have a keen sense of mathematical intuition. What I want you to do is pick your favorite letter, like J for instance. Now I'm going to let J equal the cosecant of X. Think about what happens if I let J equal cosecant of X. My original equation of 2 cosecant squared X minus cosecant X minus 1 turns into 2J squared minus J minus 1. I think we can all agree that this is simpler. In fact, my equation has now turned into a very manageable quadratic. We can use our understanding of factoring, which I won't go through in this video, to produce the following two binomials. But before we get carried away, let's remember that j was equal to the cosecant of x. If I re-substitute cosecant of x back into my equation, you get this product of binomials. Now we can solve this equation by setting each set of brackets equal to zero. Doing so results in two slightly simpler equations that I can solve. Starting with the one on the left, I can bring the one over to the other side to get cosecant of x equals one. I'm gonna lean on my understanding of reciprocal identities to say, well, cosecant is one over sine, which means sine must be equal to one over one or the reciprocal of one. I'll simplify this by just saying sine of x is equal to one. Now on the interval zero to two pi, there's only one place where sine of x is equal to one, and that's at pi over two. I'm using my understanding of the graph of sine of x here, but you can also come up with this answer using the unit circle, which I won't do in this video just to keep it brief. So we've determined that the solution to the equation on the left is pi over two. Let's look at the equation on the right. I can bring the one over to the other side and divide by two to produce a slightly simpler equation. The cosecant of x is equal to negative one over two. 
Again, I can lean on my understanding of reciprocal trig identities to say that this equation is really just sine of x is equal to negative 2 over 1, also known as sine of x is equal to negative 2. Going back to my understanding of the graph of sine of x, I know that the minimum of sine of x is negative 1, and this function will never reach negative 2. You can also show this by trying to solve for x using your calculator and the sine inverse function. If you take the sine inverse of negative 2, you should get an error. So we can conclude that this equation has no solutions. Therefore, my original equation only has one solution on the interval 0 to 2 pi, which is pi over 2. If you're curious, type the left side of this equation into a graphing calculator, and you can confirm the only solution on 0 to 2 pi is in fact pi over 2. This is the only point on this graph where this function is equal to 0 on that interval 0 to 2 pi. The last example I want to walk you through here involves using trig identities. These problems can often be very challenging and very intimidating because they involve trig identities, which most people are scared of to begin with, and then you're combining that with solving a trigonometric equation, which often scares people off as well. So on the left side of this equation, I have 2 sin x cos x minus 1. If you know your double angle identities, you know that 2 sin x cos x is equal to sine of 2x. Making that substitution, I simplify my equation into sine of 2x minus 1 equals 0. Even simpler would be sine of 2x equals 1. If I think about the graph of sine of x, I know this function reaches its max only once between 0 and 2 pi. Comparing this to the graph of sine of 2x, which has a period of pi and goes through two full cycles in 2 pi, I know this graph reaches its 1 twice in 2 pi, at pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. So if the graph of sine of x reached its maximum of 1 at pi over 2, and I've compressed this graph into a period of pi to get the sine of 2x, it makes sense that the sine of 2x reaches 1 at pi over 4. Since the period is pi, I can simply add pi to pi over 4 to produce the second solution, in this case, 5 pi over 4. So we're able to produce two solutions using our understandings of the graph of sine and sine of 2x. The key here is using the period of pi to produce both solutions. So as is the case with math, there are definitely more complex trigonometric equations that you can solve than these, but if you have a good understanding of the three methods I showed you in the previous video and I used throughout this video, you should be able to tackle pretty much any problem. As usual, thanks for watching. Thanks.